Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. It is time for us to fellowship in the Word of God, and we're excited about getting in the Scriptures. It's a blessing to be able to feed our faith. Growing up, they would use an expression called saying something like feed in your face, and they were talking about satisfying the natural appetite of the physical body. Well, in the kingdom of God, we understand what it means to feed your faith. Our faith is being made alive by Jesus Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit. But we have a role to play and we have to feed our faith. And we do that by fellowshipping and studying and meditating and speaking forth God's word. God's word is a life-giving word that builds faith on the inside of our heart. Well, thank you for being committed to joining me around the Word of God. You have to be disciplined to be able to come and gather around the Word when you are not perhaps in a physical location with others. And you want to be that type of person that has that kind of discipline in your life that you know that on Wednesday at 7 p.m. you are going to gather around the table of truth. You're going to join Pastor Curley to get in God's word and we are going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And God witnesses that. The Bible says the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows our priorities. He knows our heart. He knows what we, how we value him, how we value his word. And I want to encourage you as a Christian, uh, set your heart that you're going to make it a priority uh, to fellowship in the word of God, to join together consistently, coming together at that set time so that we can fellowship in God's word. God is honored. You will be strengthened and edified in your faith. Your spirit man will be strong in the Lord and you'll be able to walk in the victory that Christ have already ordained for your life. Well, we're going to pray and we're going to go right into chapter 11 of the book of Zechariah. Father, we thank you for what Christ Jesus have done that we might have the book of life, that we may have the word of God provided to us that we may know you and we may know your ways. I pray now in the name of Jesus for your blessing on all those, Father, who are committed to coming together and gathering around the table of truth, the fellowship in the word of God. I pray, Father, the favor of God on their life, the goodness of God manifesting in their life, and I pray, God, that they will walk in the strength of the Lord. Their faith will be strong, Father. They will be able to use their faith to be able to quench every fiery dart that the enemy, Satan, will sin against their life, against their children, against their finances, against their marriages, those who are married, Father, against their local church, that they might be able to carry out the will of God with joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. We thank you now. We believe now you have given us the anointing, Father, that we might be able to rightly divide the word of God in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're not there, take your Bible and turn to Zechariah, the chapter 11. We're talking about our theme has been for quite a while now, awakening to God's love. And that is to be able to see that despite the circumstances that we're in, in our present world today, that just like it was in the days of Israel and Judah, different things going on around them, but yet God was fulfilling the purpose and plan in and through their lives. And that despite all of those difficult times, God was yet unfolding his plan. And God is doing that in your life. That regardless of what you could be facing today, God is present with you. If you were born again, he is there with you. He is strengthening you day by day. He is giving you his courage. He is confident in you through that situation. So I, I want to encourage you, keep your eyes on the Lord. That's right. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Well, we're in chapter 11 today. And in chapter 11, we witness a transition from chapter 10. In chapter 10, we saw where God, speaking through the prophet Zechariah, began to reflect upon the promised blessings. Uh, but now in chapter 11, we enter a phase where the prophet began to reveal new calamities, a judgment that's going to come upon Israel and Judah. He uses some rich prophetic a rich poetic imagery, the prophet Zechariah, in describing the enemy approaching Judah from the north. The inhabitants of the land will suffer great trauma as a result of this invasion, and as the chapter unfolds, it's evident that this terrible judgment is due to Israel's rejection 
of this good shepherd. And man, we're going to look at this good shepherd as this imagery of a shepherd is used throughout this particular chapter. And to begin with, in verses 1 through 3, I call this no place to hide. You see, when God's judgment is set in motion, no person, place, or thing can cause it not to occur. God alone is sovereign and he will determine exactly if or not he will cause that judgment to manifest. And so in chapter 11, verse 1 opens up with this. He says this, open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Well, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen because the mighty trees are ruined. Well, O oak of Bashan, for the thick forests have come down. Verse 3 says, There is the sound of well and shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruin. Now, as a result of this destruction, the shepherd leaders are wailing in the land is entirely devastated. The poetic description is believed to look 600 years in the future when Rome invaded Jerusalem. So here, as we look at these different symbols of Lebanon and cedar and uh the thick forest, these symbols are being used to show where God will allow these individuals, his people, to suffer such judgment. In other words, just like the uh, uh, Lebanon, the, uh, the, it will begin from the north and it's going to sweep through God's people, it's going to sweep through Israel. And when the, the, the cypress trees are falling, that represent the trees in the forest. Once those trees fall, then all of a sudden, the people of God will be open game. They will not have any protection from their enemy. But remember now, it is because they are rejecting the good shepherd. You know, it's good to know that in the times we're living in, in times of war and the economic uh, challenges that's facing our world today, gas prices and all kinds of things, violence and everything, it's good to know that we have a spiritual covering that the Bible assures us of. Yes, God promised us in Psalms 91, verse 1 and 2, and I want to read that. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place, one translation say, the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Now, before we can say that, we got to be secure knowing that God is protecting us. We dwell in his presence. And the Bible even make reference to uh, we are able to uh, be abide under his shadow. Some of us remember growing up and we get our shadow. We would tell people, get out of my shadow. In other words, if we're going to be in the shadow of God, that tells us how close we are to God. That tells us how close and intimate we are in fellowship with God. We are right there under his shadow. And the, and the psalmist says, because of that, we're able to speak that which is revealed in the word. And that is that God is an almighty God. He is our refuge, our fortress, and him we're going to trust. And I want to encourage you, in the times that we're in, make sure that you are trusting in the almighty God. And so he goes on and he talks about in verse three, there is the sound of wailing shepherds. What's that? Grief and sorrow and sufferings these shepherds are experiencing because of what? Because of this judgment. And the Bible even said, for their glory is in their ruins. In other words, this that is coming upon these shepherds is because of the decision they have made. Is because of their rebellion and their rejection of the good shepherd. And God is holding these leaders accountable. Now, if we come down to verse uh, 4 and 6, you know what? I just thought about some. You and I that abide under the shadow of the Almighty, we are, we are secure in God. He's our protector because we are the blessed people of God. 
And sometimes people think they're blessed because, you know, they can look at material things. That, that is not a sign of the blessing. The Bible talks about in Psalms chapter 1 how the psalmist opened up that great worshiping book. And he said, blessed is the man or woman or the boy or girl who walk not in the counsel or the advice of the ungodly nor stand in the path of sinners. In other words, they don't position themselves to live like sinners. That's what it means to stand. Notice, you, 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 you're you not running in the path, you're standing. You don't position yourself to live like sinners. Doesn't mean that we don't sin, but we don't position our life that we're going to live like sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scorn. But what that mean? That mean we don't sit back mocking God's word. We don't sit back making ridicule of God's word. We hear the word of God and we receive it by faith. And the Bible says it's that crowd that's blessed. So when you're talking about being blessed by God, you need to know it's because you listen to God's counsel. You listen to his word. Because the psalmist come right on down and said that uh, he shall delight himself in the word of the Lord. Or she shall delight herself in the word of the Lord. And in that word they meditate day and night. See, you love the word of God. That's why you're listening right now. You have a heart for the word of God. If I was up here screaming and performing, you could just come get an emotional, you know, jerk and feel good and, you know, throw your head back and throw your wig off and whatever. But no, no, you, you, you like understanding. You like knowledge. You're a Christian. You want to know your book and you want to know that God has placed these certain people in the body who've been through training and studying and been anointed by God and, you know, they may not be your pastor, but you have a, a, a way of reaching out and being able to know that, you know, I listen to my pastor. Thank God for my pastor. You should listen to your pastor. That should be the first source that you go to in hearing the word of God. Well, the first source is really you getting before God and reading your Bible yourself. But he said, I'll give you pastors after my heart. But then God will show you other people in your life and you will know them. You won't be running from person to person, listening everywhere in a doctrine, but God will put certain people or certain ministry in your heart and you will be connected to that ministry. And it's that anointing. It's that truth. It's that understanding. It's that light that's drawing you to that table of truth. And I want to thank you, Word of Life Church. First of all, thank you for being committed to the things of God. And you're just not a member of Word of Life, but you are committed to the Word. And I want to thank all those from surrounding areas. Man, I see some names out there, people that I know. I know your children. And you come to this tape, and I appreciate God for you. It's just a blessing to see that you, you love the Word of God. Well, let me go on because this is this is a great message. But he said they delight themselves in the track. The King James verse say the law of, the, of God, but we know that's the Word of God. And in that law, they meditate day and night. And the Bible said this, and they shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on around that tree. It doesn't matter how hot the sun get. They're going to get water in their root. God, why? They're right at a river. And God said, you will bring forth your fruit in your season. Boy, that's something to shout about. But where does it begin? It begins when you don't listen to the counsel of the ungodly. You don't stand in the way of sinners. You don't sit in the seat of the scornful, but you delight yourself in the word of the Lord. So in verse 4 and 6, I call this obedience without reward. Now, Zechariah, he shifts now, and God places him in somewhat of a role play. You know, during biblical days, man, God told them prophets to do some things that these people going around just claiming to be prophets, they wouldn't dare do. Man, look at what he told Jeremiah to do, and, and he told Ezekiel to do things, man, people would have called them crazy. But they were committed to following and obeying God. And God would use their life as an example to teach Israel an object lesson of the judgment or suffering that was going to come upon them. But we live in a time now, man, people look at positions in the kingdom of God as if though, you know, they're in the kingdoms of this world. They look at prestige. They look at the ceremony where people come and they go through all these rituals. You better be careful with all that ritual stuff. You get caught up in demonic activity. You get caught up in worshiping a creature. Boy, if you got God's anointing on your life, listen, if you got God's anointing on your life, you don't have to go through all of that. People will know it. They'll know it when you stand up and open your mouth. They'll know it when they see the fruit of your label. They'll know it when they see the humility in your heart. Glory to God. Well, he goes on. Listen to verse 4. He said, Thus says the Lord my God, feed the flock for slaughter. Notice what he said. God told Zechariah, 
I want you to role play. I want you to be, be a one that I can use to give an example. And I want you to feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughtered them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, for I am rich and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and to the hand of his king. They shall attack the land and I will not deliver them from their hand. Zechariah now receives his first prophetic commission to shepherd the flock. That is to play the role of a ruler to national Israel. The nation is called a flock of slaughter because it is destined for destruction at the hands of their present shepherds. We see that in verse 5 and 6. If the prophet Zechariah was concerned or consumed with a need for self-success or to have his ego stroke or to be able to identify himself as being successful because of all the good that's happening around the group that God has sent him to, he will be very disappointed. Why? Because God is telling him to feed the flock for slaughter, not for success. Not so people can look at it and say, oh, look, look at Zechariah. No, for slaughter, for judgment. You know, I thought about when Isaiah in chapter six, man, that was an awesome moment in his life when he began to just seek the Lord and cry out to God. When you cry out to God, man, God can give you some experience. And God gave him experience. God allowed him to see the throne room. And man, he began to re uh, uh, communicate what he saw and all of it was worship. It was all the creatures there worshiping the Most High God. And then Isaiah, in humility, because when you're in the glory of God, God will speak to you about things in your life. When you're worshiping God and that anointing and glory is in that place, some people are waiting on God to give them a word for somebody else, and God has a word for you, especially if there's some things in your heart that God's trying to get you to deal with in your life. Right in that glory, right in where all that light is shining, that anointing, God is speaking to you about things in your life. And that's what happened to Isaiah. He was so humble. He cried out to the Lord. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among the people of unclean lips. But how I many know he confessed their sin before God? And when you confess your sins before God, God will bring forgiveness. God, gave, God forgave him for his sin. But I want you to listen to what, how he responded in Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 89. After God had touched him, after God had cleansed him, after God had washed him, after God had sanctified him, he said, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I sin and who will go for us? Then said I, who will go for the Godhead? Who will go for the triune God? And notice, he didn't even tell him what he's going to be going to do. He didn't even lay out a plan that was going to be beautiful and how successful it would be. Isaiah was just so committed because God had touched him, because God had forgiven him of his sin. He was so grateful, so humble, till he cried out, Here am I, Lord, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but perceive not. <laughs> Isaiah didn't know what was coming next. And God is basically saying, You're going to a stubborn people. I'm sending you to a people that they're not going to take heed to what you're preaching. But yet I'm sending you to those people. And then Isaiah said, Lord, how long? In other words, how long am I going to put up with these people? How long am I going to put up with these people resisting you? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants and the houses without a man and the land be utterly desolate. In other words, God said, until I finish my job until I complete what I'm doing so that I can raise up a people that will obey me so I can raise up a people that will be humble and faithful and obedient to my word. You see, success in God's assignment is not for the building or stroking of our egos or providing a sense of identity to stroke our self-esteem, but for the fulfillment of whatever God is set to do for his glory. And that's the attitude you have to have. Because so often we measure the church 
by the world's standard of success. And there are things that God could be doing in a church that could be in line with the purging. It could be something that God is doing so that he can withdraw himself that the people may begin to seek him and thirst after him. It could be something that, that, that God is doing in the church that what we call chaos could be God setting it up for a great move of his spirit. But he has to get the attention of the people to give themselves over to prayer, to give themselves over to fasting and seeking the Lord. I'm just saying we got to stop using the measuring gauge of the world in order to define success in God's kingdom. Listen to Jesus in Mark chapter 6 when he goes into his hometown. And you think about Jesus, there were times he went in places and the Bible said all were healed. The Bible said people came from every city and town. People came to be healed and all were healed. But then when he went back to his hometown, People could not relate to that anointing on his life. They could only see him in the way they knew him, the way they knew his family. They were too familiar with him to believe that God was manifesting himself through Jesus. So listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Now this is Jesus. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. You say, but that's Jesus, the miracle worker. Oh, you know what? He was looking for faith. He was looking for people to trust God. He was looking for people to show that they were dependent on the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 6, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. See, sometimes people want to say, well, whatever the Lord wants to do, he'll do. That's true, but God it works with faith. You see, right now, people don't understand that a lot of time, and they got time for television shows all day long. They got time to spend time doing a lot of things carnal that's feeding their natural flesh or their natural, you know, desires. You got to balance that thing out. There's nothing wrong with watching movies and things of that nature, but you got to balance that thing out. Are you hungry for the word of God like that? Well, then that's why you're here. That's why you're right here now listening to the word of God, because I believe you're balanced in your life. But there are some, they're not balanced. And you know what? When it comes to God, they're always tight. I've heard people say that. I'm tired. I'm tired. Too tired to go to church. Too tired to get involved with things in the ministry. You know, I just, after work, I'm just tired. You got to remember who you're talking to. You're talking to God because whatever we do, the Bible says, in word or deed, do it as unto the Lord and not man. You got to understand. A lot of people, they don't understand the word of God. But if you know the word of God, you got to remember you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God who rewards our faithfulness. He's the God who lavishes us with good things when he sees that we have what? We have our hearts in the right places. Notice the character of these shepherds or national leaders that Zechariah brings out in the scripture. First of all, they are worthless. Yes, the scripture revealed they are worthless they justified their selfish leadership decisions. And the Bible reveals us about the character of these shepherds. You see, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And all we got to do is begin to model Christ and what it means to be a true shepherd of God. These are not good shepherds. And God is bringing these leaders out. He's holding them accountable. And the Bible said, and verse 5, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. They what they do? They mistreat the sheep. They mistreat these leaders are mistreating those people under their leadership. And God said they feel no guilt. Why? Because they justify themselves. You know, when people can justify themselves, they can deceive themselves. And their conscience is basically agreeing with what they want to believe anyway. And then they say, who, those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord. What's that? False worship. Yeah, selling them. This is God's flock. These are, are leaders, national leaders. And the Bible says they are taking advantage of God's flock and call it worship. It's false worship. Another thing, uh, they say, for I am rich. They think they're rich, but they're really poor. Remember in the book of Revelation, those seven churches? 
And that church was talking about how rich it was and how blessed it was. And God said, you are poor and naked. Again, we got to stop measuring things by the standard of the world and what we see in the natural. And their shepherds do not pity them. They are merciless. They don't have mercy on the flock. And then the scripture goes on to say, listen to what God says, for I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land. In other words, God is bringing his judgment upon his people. Because, remember, they are rejecting the good shepherd. So part of God's judgment is to allow these worthless shepherds, leaders, to oppress the flock. We see that in verse number six. God is basically saying they shall attack the land and get this. I will not deliver them from their land. Why? Because they're rejecting the good shepherd. Don't that look like Jesus? Don't that look like how Jesus came into the world and how he was rejected by his own? How the Jews rejected him, how they crucified him, the good shepherd, the one sent by God, how they mocked him, how they laughed at him, how the Pharisees treated him, the scribes would not listen to him. Don't that mirror a lot of what we see when Christ came as the good shepherd in a, in, into the world? Well, let's go on in verse 7 and 8. I call this continuing the course. It says this, so I led the flock for slaughter. That's, that's Zachariah. Remember, he's role playing. He's carrying out this, that God. I mean, it's like he's on a commission. God has commissioned him to this role play. And he's playing the role of this shepherd. So I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. The prophet Zechariah continues in the role assignment to in, in, in the role assigned to him by God to carry out the symbolism of shepherding the flock. And Zechariah takes up two staffs. A shepherd often carried a rod in a staff. In Psalm 23 and 4, we love that song. The Lord is our shepherd. Yes, and he is our shepherd. Calls us to lie down in green pastures. You know what that means? He causes us to be in places where he causes us to prosper and do well in life, to meet our needs. That's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd lead the sheep to the water. They lead the sheep to the food. A good shepherd, and that's what God is. And then the Bible says his rod and his staff, they comfort us in Psalms 23 and 4. Now, the purpose of the rod was used to ward off the wild beasts. That's why the shepherd had the, had, had the rod in his hand. Yeah, he wasn't beating the sheep. He was beating the wild beasts that would come to try to attack the sheep. And the crooked staff was used to guide the flock and to rescue those who were straying away. That's what a good shepherd does. And when they went to rescue those who were straying away, they would get them and they would pick them up. They would carry them. How close. That's how God is. When we wander off course, man, his mercy and his love, he just don't bring us back. He picks us up and he carries us and, and he holds us close to him, letting us know how much he loves us and how merciful he is. For he's a good shepherd. I'm glad the Lord is my shepherd. Hallelujah. Now, now, Zechariah, he gives names to two shepherding tools. In verse 7b, he calls it beauty and he calls it bonds. Now, beauty means grace, favor, and delight. This staff symbolizes the loving and gracious care of the good shepherd. That's what God was providing them, but they rejected it. He, he wanted to give them that loving care. He wanted to let them know that, you know, I, wanna, I, I want you to learn how to delight yourself in me. And then he goes on, the second staff are called bands, and this staff symbolizes the unifying mission of the good shepherd. And that unifying mission in John 10, 16, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, and I have other sheep which are not of this fold, those also I must bring, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock, one shepherd. Notice, which are not of this fold. 
fold. In other words, this band is symbolic of God's bringing together his mission of unifying Israel and Judah. And because we have been engrafted in by the blood of Jesus, God, he brings unity into his body. It is one body of Christ. God is the God of unity. But here again, what's happening? They are rejecting the good shepherd. So by using the two staffs, Zechariah acted out the role of the good shepherd. And so in verse number eight, we come down. It says this, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loved them and their soul also abhorred me. Now, the prophet acts out the part of leadership that obedience must be exalted above personal feelings and even the potential for negative backlash. Within one month, he dismissed three national leaders in that time period. Now, there are different uh, uh, translations of exactly uh, who these three national leaders represent, but we know this, that Zechariah and carrying out the role, play of a good shepherd, was willing to obey God regardless of the negative backlash. And I've seen leaders in churches afraid to address certain things that needed to be addressed, afraid to call certain people in to accountability, worrying about them leaving the church, and you know, and a lot of times it's because of their level of giving. Boy, that's a great test for a leader. That's a great test for leaders to know of their pastor. Is pastor treating this person a certain way because of their financial standing in the church? I've seen people do that all because of their family standing. They're afraid of getting in those type churches where they're voting them in and voting them out. They're afraid to take a stand for the word. Now, I'm not talking about just people out there abusing the church, misusing the church. I'm not talking about that because you've got that. You've got bad shepherds out there. you got shepherds God didn't see. It. But there are times when the shepherd is trying to obey the word of God and he, he, he recognizes it's going to cost him something. Now he know because of the type of spirits he's dealing with. Well, notice what happened in the case with Zechariah. The Bible said, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loved him. In other words, he was grieved. He was disgusted in their behavior. Why were they behaving? We just seen how they were behaving. They were abusing the sheep. They were taking advantage of the sheep. And all of a sudden, the prophet is disgusted with this, agreed with this, and he takes a leadership role. He holds them accountable, and he sets them down. But notice what happened now. And their soul also, that word of horror means they hated him. See, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be able to stop trying to hide behind somebody else and get, some other body, get somebody else in the church to go do what you need to deal with. Now, there are things that perhaps you've delegated people in positions of authority, and they need to be strong enough. you got some weak people. When you delegate something, they go back and say, the pastor said. Now, they're supposed to be a leader over that ministry, and they're trying to be friends with everybody, be buddies with everybody. And they can't go there and know, they know exactly what the standard is. They know the person is doing something out of order and they'll go back and just look at them and sometimes they will agree with them. Sometimes they will make the person feel like, you know, it's okay to do that. But then they'll come to the pastor and now they, you know, and the pastor's wondering, well, why didn't you take a leadership position and having it right there? Now a person may feel a little discouraged because the pastor is involved. So some things the pastor don't even need to be brought to his attention. They need to know he got people in place that it's okay to tell people no. And no is the right answer. In some cases, no is God's answer. Rather than if you're a people pleaser, you just want to keep face with people, you just want to keep people liking you, you're not a real leader. You're a hireling. And it's all about you. Well, I'm telling you right now, listen to what Zachariah is doing. He knows it's going to cost him some, but it's okay. He's obeying God. He's doing what God is telling him to do. So long as you're obeying God, you have God's backing. And if God's standing with you, it doesn't matter who stands against you. They won't be able to stand. They won't be able to prevail. Well, let's move on. This is the word of God. Now, and God is, God is dealing with what needs to be addressed. The Amplified Bible reads verse 8 like this. 
And I cut off the three shepherds, the civil authorities, the priests, and the prophets in one month. For I was weary and impatient with them, and they also loathed me, or they hated me. And then we come on down now to verse number nine. He goes on, then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perishing. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. Now, the prophet's role shifts to that of reacting to the flock. We see that in verse number nine. Now, during the Roman siege in A.D. 70, it is reported that many died. Many died due to that uh, 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 plague that also swept in Jerusalem during that time. And some say this is alluding to that. There was a famine there to the point that people began to turn to cannibalism. They began to eat one another. Well, you know, that's a bad time to be in. That is a bad time to be in. And so, the, but again, remember, they are doing what? They are rejecting the good shepherd. Yes. And so God has Zechariah carrying out this role play of a good shepherd. And Zechariah is dealing with the bad shepherds. He's holding them accountable. And the people are going to experience God's pending judgment. Well, let's move on. Now, verse 10, it says, And I took my staff, beauty, and cut it in two, that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word from the Lord. Did you get that? The poor got a revelation that Zechariah is only acting out, carrying out, obeying the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages and if not refrain. So they weighed out for my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the part and princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Then I cut into my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. I call this God's timing. The rejection of the good shepherd means that the national unity Zechariah had hoped for would not be achieved at this particular time. We witnessed after making the announcement of the fate of the shepherds in the national flock of Israel, the prophet symbolically breaks his first staff. What's that? Grace, favor, delight. He breaks it. God would withdraw his gracious protection of his people because they rejected the good shepherd. Remember, all of this is God responding to the disobedience of his people. However, you notice, and I read this, the poor had a different reaction. And the poor was the ones that these shepherds had really mistreated. They were the ones that was getting the worst of the situation. And they end up what? They end up being suffering just like the others. But they got a revelation that Zechariah is obeying the word of the Lord. In verse 12, the wages the good shepherd is requesting, notice he requested that in verse 12, said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. What he's doing? The wages is symbolic of what he really want them to give him. What's that? Repentance, faith, obedience. But guess what? They don't give it. They don't give it to him. Now, this act reveals their continual state of their heart. Why? Because they responded. They responded and said, okay, we're not going to give you wages. We're going to give you 30 shekels of silver. What's that? That was the price of a slave. According to Old Testament in Exodus 21, 32. What they're showing God. This is what we think of you. This is how we value your word. This is all we get. This is all you get from us. The wages of a slave. Where do our mind go? To those Sadducees, those rulers, those chief priests called Judas. We'll pay you. We'll give you money. 
to betray Jesus. And what did they give him? 30 shekels of silver. What's that? The mark of a slave. It tells how they value God. And I tell you, saints, our giving does say something about how we honor God. Yes, it says something about how we honor God in our giving. God don't want us to worship money. God don't want us to love money. He wants us to love him. And he wants us to be at the right heart toward money. And a lot of time we can, we can just be real with ourselves and, and say, you know, I, I value God this much. I value God this much. Because anybody can get up and say, I love the Lord. When, God, when Jesus asked Peter that after he had denied him in John's gospel, when he uh, meets Peter again, the first question he asked Peter, do you love me? Peter had repented. Peter had repented, but God wanted to know that in that repentance, do you really love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord. And, and I'm paraphrasing. And what he said, feed my sheep. Asked him again, feed my lamb. What was it about? Making sure that you make my kingdom a priority. Making sure you make my people a priority. By feeding them, nourishing them, building them up in the things of God. Peter could have kept saying, I love you, I love you, Lord. But Jesus put some type of witness to it. Well, if you love me, Peter, obey me. Do what I call you to do. Feed my sheep and feed my lamb. And Peter did feed the sheep and Peter did feed the lambs. Their actions uh, finds fulfillment in the money paid by Judas. And you can find that in Matthew 26, 15. Now, in verse 13, you notice here, God responds to their ungrateful heart in using sarcasm. The Lord refers to their wages as the goodly price which I was elevated or was evaluated by him. That's what he said when he said in verse 13, and the Lord said to him, throw it to the potter. And then he told him, say that princely price they set on me. <laughs> you know, it's like some sarcasm here. God said, this is what they think about me. Just throw it to the potter. Because it reveals their ungrateful heart. It reveals that they are not receiving the instructions in the words that I'm speaking through the prophet. And in the verse 14, the prophet now, he severed his second staff named Bands, and that means the brotherhood between Judah and Israel is now broken, and this makes them more vulnerable to their enemies. They are no longer united. All because, again, they reject the good shepherd. And then we close in verse 15 through 17. I want to read this. It says, And the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those who are broken, nor feed those that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves, their hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blind. In verses 15 through 17, I close with this. It is God's enriching endurance. Zechariah is called up on by God to act out another prophetic commission. He is told to take the equipment of a foolish shepherd. This would include a guard, a rod, a staff, and other accessories. So God tells the prophet, gather all of these tools that a foolish shepherd would take with himself. This shepherd is often in the Bible associated with the Antichrist. Notice the character of this shepherd. No care for the suffering flock. The young flock. No healing for the broken. Not, not for those who are strong and standing. He will only use the flock for his personal desires and destroy them at any cost. It's a foolish shepherd. And so God is commissioning the prophet Zechariah. I, I want you to role play this so my people will know what's coming because they are rejecting the good shepherd. The flock who rejected the good shepherd will suffer much under the leadership of this foolish shepherd. Shepherd, We see that in verse 16. They're going to suffer so much. 
But remember, they reject the, the good shepherd. And because he has abandoned the flock, the foolish shepherd eventually would face the judgment of God. That's what verse 17, verse 17 is ascribed to the foolish shepherd. In other words, yes, God's going to use this foolish shepherd to judge his people, but he's going to come right around and he's going to give this foolish shepherd exactly what he deserved. I tell you what, you and I, we are blessed to, and privileged to have over us the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, and, and, and I want to just kind of turn to John chapter 10. We're familiar with that. And I want to read a few verses because this lets us know the kind of shepherd that we have over us right now. Zechariah was speaking to Israel and Judah. And he was projecting the future of what's going to happen out of their rejection of the good shepherd. And how they are going to go into bondage and how they're going to be taken into captivity by the Romans. All because they rejected the good shepherd. I want to encourage you, don't reject the good shepherd. In John 10, just read a few verses. The Bible said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. The only way into the sheepfold is through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd. There's no other way. Someone said to me one time, well, you know, I, I've learned that, you know, other people, they may serve God, but they may serve, you know, have a different way they get to God. There's only way to get to God. There's only way. Come on, Christians. Acts 4 and 12, there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's not compromise. Let's not get with those who are into religion. We let them know we're not into religion. We're not promoting religion. We're promoting righteousness. Jesus came to bring righteousness to the earth. Put us in right standing with our creator. Cause us to be justified through faith in his blood. We're in right standing with God. Pouring out his love in our heart through the Holy Spirit. Calling us children of God. Cause said, you know, I'll be a father. To, uh, uh, I, I will be a father to you. That's the God that we serve. He said, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them. That's one thing of a shepherd. A shepherd knew the names of the sheep. Of the sheep. Jesus knew the name of those who belong to him. Hallelujah. He know your name. Matter of fact, he know more than that. The Bible says he knows our down sitting and our uprising. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows all about us. That's a good thing. That's not nothing to fear. Oh, the Lord knows. He knows our weakness. Hallelujah. And as the Father pitied the Son, so the Lord pitied those who fear. Just reverence God. Just seek the Lord. Just worship God. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. Notice, he leads them. They follow him. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Listen, your pastor is not the great shepherd. Your pastor is not the chief shepherd. The word we use is the under shepherd. But he's really a sheep too. He's really a sheep too. He's just been given an anointing and an assignment. He has to follow the great shepherd. And if he's not following the great shepherd, don't follow him. If he's not following the chief shepherd, don't follow him. You say, but he can sing and he can preach and he can hoop and he can get you happy. Don't follow him. Follow the word. That's what you follow, the word of God. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. Notice, when you're following the good shepherd, when you're following the word of God, when you hear false teaching, when you hear false doctrine, you're not going to go over there and say, I just want to taste it. I just want to see what it tastes. Don't taste it. Hallelujah. Taste the Lord. He is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So Jesus said, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. And the Bible said Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke. Then Jesus said to them, Most of I say, I am the door of the sheep. So he brings it, but so he, ex he explains it. In verse 14, he seals it. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. Boy, we we know the Lord, and the Lord knows us. Because we are the sheep of his pasture. 
I don't know about you, I am thankful to be a part of the sheepfold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I am glad I am following Jesus. And I know you are too. When I tell you what, Zechariah, he's a true prophet. He's not in it for personal gain. He's not in it so people can, you know, give him strokes and stroke his ego. He can stand up and say, you know, I'm preaching good uh, work. You know, he's not in it so people can pack out his house because he's saying a lot of encouraging things. He's saying what the Lord said. And right now in chapter 11, the Lord is letting Israel and Judah know, I know what's coming ahead. I know what you're going to do in the future. And I know you're going to reject the good shepherd that I'm going to send to you. And boy, when Jesus came and he went to Calvary, they rejected him. They rejected him. And he was God's shepherd sent to lead his flock. So the message is clear through the prophet Zechariah. God calls his sheep to listen and obey. He also calls his shepherds to a role in relationship as servant leaders who seek not their own, who holds themselves in the sheep to a standard of righteousness that is from the Lord and to love and feed his sheep. And when we feed the sheep of God, we should be motivated by our love for God. Should not be money. And that doesn't mean that pastors should not be taken care of, but that should not be our motivation. We should not be fleecing the flock. Man, I've seen things and heard people do things as pastors or bishops or whatever you want to call them. And man, I said, man, they ought to be uncomfortable doing that. I believe there's a line that we have to maintain, a boundary line we have to maintain as pastors so that we won't get in that position whereby we become like dictators and, 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 and fleecing the flock. And I've seen young pastors grow up and they get under these guys and they look at all the material things. See, these young people are moved by material things. You and I grew up in a time where our parents didn't have a lot. But man, we had love and we had unity and we had community and all of that. That was much greater than this material stuff. But the younger generation, they're driven by, by fads. They're driven by material things. And these young pastors, man, they're just, you know, they're looking at certain people. They just want the stuff. Come on, we got to set a better example. We got a model of righteousness, a, a servant leadership, a heart of humility. So these young men and young ladies coming up in the body of Christ can have some role models where they'll see it's not about them, it's about Jesus. It's about the word of God. It's about God being honored and how we uh, serve and love the flock. Well, I want to close with a faith action question. It goes simply like this. How can you be a great witness of what it is to have the protection and the provision of a good shepherd? How can you be a great witness of what it is to have the protection and provision of a good shepherd? Jesus Christ is a good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, the Lord our shepherd. Hallelujah. And we want to be a witness of what it means to be under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow him and let him make us his disciple of men. Hallelujah. The scripture I like, and we use this scripture in our prayer time as a church when we gather together on Sundays, we gather together first to pray together. In Isaiah 50 and 4, the prophet said, God has given me the tongue of the learned. That is the tongue of a disciple, trained in the word, sensitive to the voice of God, that I may know how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. He waketh me morning by morning to hear with the tongue of the learned. A trained disciple, a student of the word of God, one who has put in the work, the discipline, the, the commitment to know the voice of the good shepherd. And then the one way we know that voice, and one of the primary ways we know that voice is through the word of God. He speaks the language of the Bible. And when we know the word of God, we'll know that that is the voice of the good shepherd. Thank you for 
staying on course with me with these prophetic books. God is speaking prophetically. Hallelujah. No, I'm not standing up saying, yea, the Lord said, speaking some King James language and all of that. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to start the school of the prophets and telling people how to get up and, you know, give people a few words and give them to no, no, I'm not doing any of that. I'm going through the prophetic books with you line up on line. Then I'm taking and being able to make it applicable by looking through the lens of this new covenant we are under, keeping all things equal, that which was pertaining specifically to Israel and Judah, making sure we are rightly handling that part of the scripture, but also understanding the principles that, are, that is applicable over to the New Testament and seeing what that looks like to you and I today. And you and I today, we have the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, who have opened the door for us to enter into his sheepfold, and he promised that we will hear his voice, that he will protect us, and that when the wolf come, when a stranger show up, we will not listen, we will not follow, but we will follow the voice of the good shepherd. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus' name.